What were Jesus' parents' names? Uh, Mary and Joseph. Very good. Yes, very good. I got that very one. good. And approximately how many years ago did he live? Oh, gosh. 250 million years ago. Okay, how many wise men were there? Um, 12. All right, what did they bring Jesus' gifts? They brought him some wine. Who found the burning bush? Uh, Nixon? What happened in the fight between David and Goliath? The story, what They happened? got in a fight with rocks. Who won? Goliath. Who was swallowed by the whale? Okay, now I'm on the spot. Um, Joe? DiMaggio? Cain and? Abel. That's right, and who were they? Uh, sitcom. The Old Testament was originally written in what language? Um, isn't it Old English? Old English. Or Latin or something? Old English script. How many apostles were there? Um, 40. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat with his apostles to eat and drink. The check was enormous. Adrian finished this line from the Bible. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's car. Hey, gang, that was Jay Leno some 15 years ago. He called it jaywalking. He'd go out on the street, ask people questions. And here's what I hope. My prayer today is as you listened to that, as you watched, that you felt pretty good about what you know about the Bible. Uh, if you don't, well, here's the deal. You've come to the right place. Because we are in the third week of a worship series we are calling the Book of Mark. We are challenging everybody who calls Calvary their church home to read through the Book of Mark together. Uh, and here's why we're doing it. You see, I think for most of us, uh, we have this sort of awkward tension in our faith life. We love Jesus, we love who he is, and that he brings hope and peace to our lives. But the truth is, for most of us, we don't feel all that comfortable with the story of Jesus. We don't feel all that comfortable with the Bible, to be honest. And, and there's good reason for that. Nobody gave you the tools, nobody gave you the filters way back when that allowed you to read the Bible. Uh, and consequently, the Bible seems confusing, it seems intimidating. The thought of reading the Bible uh, has you thinking, I know I'm going to be in over my head. And so what most of us as followers of Jesus do, we sort of rely on what others say about Jesus. We rely on what popular culture says about Jesus. We rely on our church traditions. Uh, but here's the truth, and this is what I want to talk to you about today. The truth is this, if we just rely on tradition, if we simply rely on what popular culture says about Jesus, if we just simply rely on what we think Jesus said, if we simply rely on tradition, well, the truth is there's a whole lot we're missing when it comes to Jesus. You see, as followers of Jesus, here's what we believe at Calvary, uh, that if we're going to follow Jesus, we ought to know the real story of who Jesus really is. It's not simply about personal preferences or what we want Jesus to be. Uh, there's a great movie from the 2000s. It came out in 2006. Uh, anyone remember the comedy Talladega Nights? Uh, it's starring Will Ferrell. He's this race car driver from the South who's had all kinds of success. Again, it's a comedy, uh, but watch as the family gathers around the dinner table. Supper's ready! Come on, y'all! Been slaving over this for hours! Dear Lord, baby Jesus, or as our brothers to the south call you, hey Zeus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to say thank you for my family, my two beautiful 
beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR, as we call. And, of course, my red-hot smoking wife, Carly, who is a stone-cold fox. Mm. Also want to thank you for my best friend and teammate, Cal Naughton Jr., who's got my back no matter what. Shake and bake. Dear Lord Baby Jesus, we also thank you for my wife's father, Chip. We hope that you can use your Baby Jesus powers to heal him and his horrible leg. And it smells terrible, and the dogs are always mm. bothering with it. Mm. Dear tiny infant Jesus. We... Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. You know what I want? I want you to do this grace good so that God will let us win tomorrow. <sighs> Dear tiny Jesus, in your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled-up fist pawing. He was a man. He had a beard. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? I win the races and I get the money. Ricky. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says, like, I want to be formal, right. but I'm here to party, too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. I like to think of Jesus, like, with giant eagle's wings yeah. and singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with, like, an angel band. And I'm in the front row. Hey, Cal, why don't you just shut up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dear eight-pound, six-ounce, newborn infant Jesus. <laughs> it's the gospel according to Ricky Bobby, people. Again and again, his family said this. I like to think of Jesus. And there are a lot of things uh, we think are in the Bible. They're, they're sort of images we have of who Jesus is. There are also, there are some sayings that sort of roll off our tongue or other people say to us at different times. There are sayings that we think are in the Bible. There are also, there are also a whole lot of traditions. If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you've been a part of the church that you are certain must have come from the Bible. But the truth is, they're not. And I want to talk about that a little bit today because if we're simply relying on tradition, when it comes to faith, when it comes to our relationship to Jesus, there is a whole lot, there's a whole lot we're missing. For example, there are images that we have in our head of things that happened in the Bible that just aren't in the Bible. Let me give you an example of this. Adam and Eve eating an apple. I know some of you are shocked but that image of them eating an apple, it's not in the Bible. The Bible does not say that they ate an apple. Now, Veggie Tales and artists love to depict Adam and Eve with strategically placed leaves holding an apple, but the truth is the Bible doesn't say it was an apple, it was a fruit. It could have been a pomegranate, could have been a watermelon, could have been a banana. It's just not in the Bible. How about this one? Here's another one. Three kings visiting Jesus. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that three kings visited Jesus? Uh, it doesn't say three. It says there were three gifts that people brought to the stable. Uh, three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But it doesn't say that there were three kings. It could have been two. It could have been 600. We don't know. And it also doesn't say that they were kings. It says that they were magi, which means they were more like magicians. Uh, they, they were likely sort of astrologers, people into things like horoscopes. They could have been more like sorcerers. Now that changes what that first Christmas looks like, doesn't it? You see, if we rely on tradition, there are some things we're missing. How about this one? Jonah swallowed by a whale. Not in the Bible. Doesn't say that he was swallowed by a whale. It says he was swallowed by a big fish. Could have been a grouper, uh, could have been a shark. Now that would have spiced up the story a little bit. Here's another one for you. The Bible nowhere says, uh, gives us the image of Jesus as a blue-eyed blue white guy with long blonde hair and a beard. Contrary to all those pictures that were hung on the wall in your Sunday school room growing up, this image of Jesus, it's not there. 
And unless all the biblical historians are incorrect and Jesus was actually born in Oslo, Norway, likely this is not true. You see, there are all kinds of things that we've come to believe are in the Bible, uh, images, but they're not actually there. Uh, there are also there are also some sayings that are not found in the Bible, sayings that sort of roll off our tongue, sayings that sound biblical, but they're actually they're actually not. We get a great example of this in the, in the TV show The Office. Anyone remember Michael Scott? Uh, in the fourth season of the show, uh, there's an episode where Michael Scott actually runs into, with his car, his coworker, his staff member, Meredith. Meredith has to go to the hospital, and so this awkward boss, Michael Scott, he organizes all of his office mates to take a trip to the hospital room where Meredith is lying in bed. Check it out. Meredith. You know what they say in the Bible about forgiveness? Forgiveness is next to godliness. That's not, that's well, just, sh- just, just. <laughs> Michael Scott is so awkward. First off, that was hilarious. Secondly, here's the truth. Forgiveness is next to godliness. It's not in the Bible. It sounds biblical. It's close to being biblical, but it is, it's not found anywhere in the Bible. That is the gospel according to Michael Scott, not Jesus Christ. Folks, there are all kinds of sayings that sort of sound as though they must have come from Jesus. They must have come from the Bible, but they're just not. Let me give you another example of this. Sayings not found in the Bible. How about this one? Money is the root of all evil. I'm guessing at one time or another, someone said that to you. The truth is, it's not in the Bible. In fact, here's what the Bible says. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not money that's the problem. It's making money an idol. It's when we put money and the acquisition of money in front of our relationships, the people we love, caring for our neighbors. When we do that, that's when we get ourselves in trouble. Money isn't the problem. God doesn't want us to have money. But here's what God doesn't want us to do. God doesn't want us to turn into Scrooge McDuck and dream of swimming in gold coins in, our, in, in a safe somewhere. You see, there are all these sayings that sound biblical, they seem biblical, but they they just aren't. Here's another saying. God won't give you more than you can handle. How many of you had a moment in your life where you were going through a struggle and somebody said to you, God won't give you more than you can handle, right? That was really helpful. It's not only not helpful, but it's not found. It's not found in the Bible. You see, the truth is, again and again in the Bible, there were all kinds of characters that went through trying times, times of loss, times where they felt all alone and abandoned. And the truth is, it was God who walked with them through those times. The truth is, God won't give you more than you can handle. It's not in the Bible. Here's another one. God helps those who help themselves. (laughs) Do you know who said that? Benjamin Franklin. It's not in the Bible. In fact, it's sort of the opposite of the message we find in the Bible. Uh, We have a God who sent his son to us when we were still sinners, Paul writes. The truth is, this isn't biblical either. Here, a couple more. Uh, Everything happens for a reason. How many of you have heard that one? Sounds biblical, or how about this one? It's all part of God's plan. When I was a kid, my mother passed away when I was just 10. And I'll never forget, a woman came up to me and said, Hots, you're not going to understand this. But what happened to your mom, it was all part of God's plan. God needed another angel. I remember even as a 10-year-old boy going, if God works this way, I don't know if I have any interest in that God. You see, it's all part of God's plan. It's not in the Bible. In fact, it's the opposite of how God works. You see, God gave people like you and me freedom. God loves us so much that God put us into this world. And you and I, we get to make 
actual choices in this world. God doesn't control us. Uh, I have a son who just got his driver's license, and I hand him the keys and allow him to go drive, go wherever he wants, because I trust him. Uh, uh, that's how God's relationship with us is. He, he sort of hands over the keys. He doesn't have a plan, a secret plan that we don't know about. You see, all these phrases, they sort of sound biblical. They're close to bi being biblical, but they're not. It's sort of like me when I go golfing. I get ready to tee off on the, on the first tee off box and I take my practice swing, I stretch out and then I pull back and I unleash the biggest swing I possibly can. And here's what usually happens. I watch that ball go out right on down the fairway and I am proud. I'm saying to myself, finally, I'm hitting that drive that I've always dreamed of. And that's when it starts to drift. In fact, it doesn't just drift. It takes a right turn. Uh, it ends up like two fairways over. Mm -hmm. You see, I was just a little bit off in my swing. It just takes just a couple of degrees being off, the way physics works with a golf ball and a golf club. And that ball is going in the wrong direction. That's it. the way it is with these sanks. They're just a little bit off. They're close. They sound biblical, but the truth is they send us in the wrong direction. Just like here we got Charles Barkley here hitting the ball, right? His shot is just like mine. It's, it, it's close, but it sends the ball two fairways over. That's how it is with these phrases. Folks, lastly, there are some traditions that I think many of us are certain are found in the Bible, but the truth is they're not. For example, here's one that might surprise some of you if you grew up in tr church. Tithing, giving 10%. It's not a biblical image for, for how we should look at our resources. It, it's not a biblical model for generosity. The truth is, in the Bible, it talks about how tithing, giving 10%, that was a bare minimum. In fact, if you gave just 10%, you were kind of embarrassed because there were all these other offerings that you gave. You gave uh, peace offerings. You gave purification offerings. You gave sacrificial offerings. In fact, some historians suggested that the average person of faith in Jesus' day, they gave 25% of all they had. They gave it away. Tithing is not a biblical model for generosity. Here's another one that might surprise some of you. 10-minute sermons and 60-minute services. They're not in the Bible. You made that up so you can get home after church and watch the Vikings game. I know it. Here's what I say. Many sermons, they make many Christians, folks. Here's another one. Altar calls and the sinner's prayer. If you came from a tradition where that was mandatory, you had to walk up front and give your life to Jesus. You had to say a specific prayer, the sinner's prayer. This idea that there is a prescribed way that you need to go about turning your life over to God so that God will accept you. Sorry, it's not anywhere in the Bible. Here's another one, choosing your salvation. That you have anything to do with your salvation it's not biblical. In fact, Paul says you are saved by grace through faith. It's not anything that you do. Here's another one that might surprise you. Most of our church traditions, they're just not in the Bible. I mean, if you grew up in church, I hate to tell you it, this, but this next list of things, none of them are prescribed in the Bible. For example, liturgy. Worship bands, pipe organs, confirmation, robes, screens, Lent, Advent, dressing up for church, pews, sermon notes. How many of you had to do that? Bulletins, steeples, potlucks. Get this, the red hymnal, nor the green hymnal. If you're old enough, the other red hymnal, nor if you're really old, you remember the black hymnal. None of that is in the Bible. And in fact, sometimes these traditions, you know this, they can distract us. Like me swinging my golf club. They can cause our, our attention to go off in places God never intended for us to be distracted. 
You see, the truth is, if we're just relying on tradition, if we just rely on tradition, there is so much about the life of faith that we're missing. Jesus, in the book of Mark, he often gets in tussles. He gets into these arguments with the Pharisees. And this is what it's all about. Every time he gets into a tussle, it has to do with the the love that the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, had with tradition. Let me give you an example of this. In Mark chapter 7, it says this, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they cornered Jesus and they asked him this, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? What's this all about? Well, there was this group of people, the elders, who who would on occasion make up rules. It was a tradition that was handed down from generation to generation. Uh, All of the people in that ancient world would have known the law of Moses. But this tradition of the elders, they added another layer of rules on top of the 613 laws of the Hebrew Bible. They would again and again add laws in order to protect you from even coming close even coming close to breaking any of those biblical laws. The problem is this extra layer of laws, it sort of made, well, it made it hard for you to follow the one law that Jesus talked about again and again. And that was to love your neighbor as yourself because it had you preoccupied with puffing yourself up, making yourself clean enough and holy enough that it caused you to forget about your neighbor. And so those teachers of the law, those Pharisees, they said, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? There were these rules about how much you should wash, how much you should clean. They believed that an exterior cleanliness was a sign of an interior holiness. Now listen how Jesus responds to this tradition. He says this, Jesus replied, You have a fine way of setting aside God's word in order to serve your own tradition. But he doesn't stop there. Listen to this. His words have a bite. He says, you you actually nullify. You actually nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed. You've handed down. See, this is the deal. If we just rely on tradition, what we hear about Jesus, things we think Jesus said, if we just rely on popular images of Jesus, man, there is a whole lot that we are missing. Friends, I want to let you in on a little secret. Do you know how we find out what actually happened in the Bible? Do you want to know? Listen to this. We read it. We read it, and that's what we want to do with you. That's why we're doing this series. We want to actually tiptoe into the Bible, and we want to make it easy for you because the Bible was never meant to be confusing. It was never meant to be intimidating. So we've given you a few filters a couple of weeks ago. If you missed it, go back because the first week of this series, we talked about filter number one. The Bible is a compass that points us to Jesus. It always points us in one direction, just like a compass. It's not a self-help book. It's not an instruction manual that sort of tells us what to do and how to live our lives. It's not pointing at us. It's always pointing us to Jesus. The second filter we gave you was this. Knowing the context creates clarity. Knowing the context of those verses we love and we read, it creates all kinds of clarity. Too often we pull stories or images out of the Bible. And we don't know the full story. Knowing the context creates clarity. And here's the deal. Lastly, if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this. The last filter we want to give you is this. If we just rely on tradition, the things people say Jesus said, the the images in popular culture, if we just rely on tradition, well, here's what you know. There is a whole lot, a whole lot that you and I We are missing. I was buried beneath my shame. 
Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. As we close our time together, I want to invite you to share with me in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Together we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey gang, thanks so much for tuning in today. If this is your first time with us, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. The easiest way to maybe take a next step and uh, find out more about what's going on here at Calvary is simply to go out to our website, calvaryalec.org. There, hit on the button that says sign up for emails. And every Friday you'll get an email from us sharing all the things that are going on here at Calvary. We'd love for you to, to jump on board. 
Hey, there are a bunch of things going on this fall as we kick off a new season of ministry. Uh, one of those is the worship series we're in, the book of Mark. And we have several ways for you to journey through the book of Mark. We'd love for you to get caught up. It's not too late. You can head out to our website and watch the other couple of messages in this series. Easy to do. Just go to calvaryalec.org. Uh, the second way is to join our daily dose, uh, us for a d- the daily dose. We do it every evening. Again, you can catch up by simply going out to our website. And many of you have asked for one of these. Uh, it's We got permission to print the book of Mark. I added a few of my own notes. It's a great devotional. Walks you through the book of Mark in just 21 days. I hate to tell you this, but we are out. All 750 of these we have given out. So if you got one, you are a lucky one. Hey, here's another thing going on in the life of our church that's kind of unique. Uh, We have a partner network of congregations that we support. We have 10 partner churches, another 20 churches that we resource on a regular basis. All of those partners are coming to Calvary on October 7th for what we are calling the Calvary Conference. We want to let you know because we know many of you have a heart for ministry. The conference is going to include speakers from literally around the world. We have a speaker coming from Australia and another one coming, well, from St. Joe down the highway. Uh, We'd love for you to join us for this day of learning about where God is moving the church. You can head out to our website. Uh, You can see the address on the screen and there get signed up. One last thing before we close. We are in a season of getting people engaged in connect groups. What's a connect group? It's a group of about eight to 12 people who make an agreement to gather together regularly to grow in faith and to grow in life together. Uh, We'd love for you, uh, if you've never had that experience, to join a connect group. At Calvary, we believe that when it comes to faith development, circles are always better than the rows we sit in on Sunday morning. Hey gang, as we close today, we wanna say thank you for your generosity. It's because of you that we can do all we're doing. We have 435 kids signed up for kid and student ministry. This place is rocking on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, and here's why. Because of you. Because of you, we are leading another generation to a lifelong faith in Jesus Christ. So thank you for your generosity. You can make your gifts in any of the ways on the screen. Uh, The first and probably the easiest way is to head out to our website. Again, calvaryalec.org. Hit the button that says give. There you can sign up for a one-time, or I want to encourage you to consider signing up for a reoccurring gift. So you can be generous even on those weeks where you don't tune in or don't join us in person. The second way you can make your gift is with that app on your phone, Venmo, or you can cut a check, send it to the church office. The address, again, is on the screen. Or if you'd like to make a special gift, we'd love to connect with you. Give us a call. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great week.